So thanks you all for joining. Uh, we will introduce today Bola Buster, which is our methodology of um, automating Bola detection vulnerabilities, uh, which using LLMs. Uh, but first thing first, let's introduce ourselves. So my name is uh, Ravid. I'm a senior security researcher at uh, Palo Alto Networks. Um, I'm part of the WAS team, which is Web Application Security and API Security. And in my free time, I like watching football games, traveling the world, and take care of my dog, uh, Maple. <coughs> Sorry for the delay. Apparently, AI doesn't solve every, everything. We still need human in the loop. A lot of human things for the technical <laughs> team. And my name is Jay. I am a security researcher with Palo Alto Networks. My research has been focusing on identifying the risk and threats in cloud environment. Recently, I have moved, I have switched my research focus toward generative AI, in particular studying the potential malicious use of generative AI. When I'm not working, I spend most of time with my hyperactive twin boys who behave just like Minion. And I also have two cats. When my kids go to bed, I become cat slave, feeding them, cuddling with them, and cleaning their litter box. <laughs> OK. Um, so let's quickly go over the agenda for today. So we will introduce the concept of BOLA. We will see our methodology of automating BOLA detection with LLMs. We will see an actual test um, that detects a real BOLA. And eventually, we, uh, we will show you how we hunted down 17 new BOLA vulnerabilities in the wild, and what lessons did we learn uh, during the process. Um, so BOLA, or Broken Object Level Authorization. Um, first of all, our motivation for this research, for this, uh, research. Um, I'm not sure if you are familiar with BOLA, but it is the top risk at the, the OWASP API top 10. It's the number one. And it's also the fourth most reported vulnerability in Acker 1. So it's very popular. It's very severe. And there is no automation tool that actually detects uh, BOLA with, uh, in scale today. Um, for all of these reasons, we decided that we need to develop our own methodology. Uh, to be able to automate the BOLA detection and uh, solve an unsolved uh, question. If you take a look uh, in this screenshot, you can see a patient uh, application, um, which a patient can query an API call uh, and use his visit ID, and he will get his doctor uh, notes. But what would happen if the same patient will try to query another visit ID that belongs to another user? Um, if you will be able to fetch this, the sensitive data of another user, we have an authorization issue, or BOLA. So BOLA is a basically vulnerability that arises when the application fails to validate the use, if the user is authorized to access, modify, or delete object that does not belong to him. So imagine that I'm able to delete uh, Jay's uh, comment from Instagram or Twitter, which obviously I shouldn't be able to. Uh, this is the authorization issue, and we will have a, a BOLA vulnerability. And the consequences can be data leaks, data manipulation, or even a full account takeover. These are the challenges that we faced during the process of the development. First of all, uh, today's application has multiple users, typically multiple roles and resources, and it's really difficult to, to understand which user is allowed to do what. Secondly, most applications today are stateful, which means that every uh, action you make, every endpoint you call affects uh, and changes the, the state of the application. So imagine that you try to delete a comment from an article. First, you will need to create a comment, uh, sorry, to create an article, then to create a comment, and only then you will be able to delete it. So there are some dependencies between endpoints that it's really hard at first to recognize. Also, 
um, there is a problem of lack of vulnerability indicators. So imagine XSS, SQL injection, they all, all have a pattern. We all know how to recognize them pretty quickly. Bola is a logical error. Um, it's really, it doesn't have a clear pattern, so it's really um, difficult to understand whether it is a Bola or not. And lastly, uh, the context of the application. It's, it was difficult to understand exactly which endpoint or parameters return sensitive data and what is the actual impact of each action that we make. So all of this, um, this was a real challenge to automate the, the detection of BOLA in, uh, in scale. Um, and yeah. Thanks, Ravi, for covering the background. I hope everyone now understands why automating BOLA detection is not easy. So BOLA is not a new problem. It has been around for so long, ever since we had internet. However, it was only two years ago that we realized that AI might give this problem a gleam of hope. In particular, the rapid advancement of AI give, provide us with new tools to solve problems that were not possible previously. In particular, it also happened that the challenge, our challenge of extracting context and logic information from textual data is what large language models are extremely good at. So that's the beginning of our journey in using AI to solve this problem. Here's a high level overview of our methodology. The only required input is open API and open API spec or a Swagger spec. In the first stage, we identify the endpoint that can be vulnerable to BOLA. Not every endpoint can be vulnerable to BOLA. We use AI to help analyze every endpoint and its parameters to select a subset of endpoints. This step helps us focus on a smaller relevant endpoints only and avoid wasting time on the endpoints that are not at risk. So it's important to know that we call this, we call our target endpoint as potentially vulnerable endpoint, short for PVE. I will switch between target endpoint or PVE or uh, potentially vulnerable endpoint in this, in this talk. The next stage uncover the dependency relationship between each endpoint. Modern web applications are complex with one endpoint depending on many others, for example, if, we, if I want to test uh, an endpoint that updates an invoice, I first need to call the endpoint that creates the invoice. And before I can call the endpoint that creates the endpoint, I also first need to get, call the endpoint to create some transactions that can be included in the invoice. So it is crucial to identify the dependent endpoint of a target endpoint before we can accurately test it. With the endpoint dependency relationship identified, we can then calculate the execution path to each target endpoint, to each potentially vulnerable endpoint. We then create a test plan for each target endpoint. The next stage then turn the test plan for each PVE, for each target endpoint into a set of executable bash scripts using large language models. And there may be one or multiple uh, execution path to each target endpoint. We aim to cover as many paths as possible. In the last stage, we set up an actual API server and run all the executable bash script to send the actual API request to the target endpoint. The process of user registration, user login, and token refresh have all been automated. And we also use AI to help analyze the logs and response during the test to determine if, a, if an endpoint is vulnerable to BOLA. Now let's dive into more detail in each stage. The first stage identify the endpoint with input parameter that reference private, sensitive, or confidential information. These are the endpoints that we primarily focus on. These are the target endpoint, potentially vulnerable endpoint. Let's use the first endpoint as an example. 
the parameter username here indicate that this endpoint may reference to some data associated with one with a particular user. As a result, if this endpoint is vulnerable to Bola, an attacker could reset another user's password. Similarly, the second endpoint here, if it is vulnerable to Bola, an attacker may be able to change another user's input uh, e email. Traditionally, pen tester manually look through every endpoint and its parameters to identify, identify their target, to identify their target endpoint. This process has been slow and cumbersome, especially for large application with hundreds of endpoints. We leverage AI's capabilities of reasoning and understanding tasks to automate this step. Here is a snippet of the prompt that we use to communicate with AI. Basically, this, trump, this prompt instructs AI a set of rules and example to identify parameters with, uh, that may reference to sensitive information. The AI then returns us the endpoint and parameter that meet any of the conditions here. The next stage uncover the dependency relationship between endpoints. As I mentioned, mother, modern web applications are complex and stable, meaning that the, execu the execution of any endpoint can change the state of the entire application and affect the outcomes of other endpoints. That's why it is crucial to identify the dependency relationship before we can actually correctly test any target endpoints. In this diagram, the endpoints on the right, uh, we call them consumer endpoints, and the endpoint on the left are producer endpoints. This is one of the most important concepts in our research to, in order to identify the dependency relationship. Producer endpoints on the left output the values that consumer endpoints need as input. Again, the producer endpoints on the left produce output the value that the consumer endpoint needs as input. Let's use uh, this as an example. The consumer here is delete username, and in order to correctly test this endpoint, we need to feed the endpoint an existing and correct username. If we feed in a random username, the test case will always fail and give us meaningless results. In this case, this consumer endpoint has four producers, and each of these producers can all output the existing valid username that the consumer endpoint can use for testing. Each endpoint can be a producer, a consumer, or both. Let's look at another example here. The consumer endpoint here is delete comment. It has two required input, slug and common ID, and they can all come from its producers get comment and post comment. In turn, these two producers also have the dependent, the required input, slug, and they have come from their producers. And here's a snippet of the prompt that we use to teach AI to recognize dependency, dependency relationship between endpoints. It is important to, 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 to know that although uh, this process can be done through heuristic, asking, uh, using heuristic to match the output parameter with, uh, of a producer with the input parameter of a consumer. This heuristic matching algorithm is not reliable for several reasons. First, developers may use different parameter names to reference the same data object within the system. And developers may also use the same parent parameter name to reference different objects within the system. That's why we need to use AI to study, to analyze the description in the spec and match the endpoint by their functionality rather than just the parameter uh, name. The next stage turns the pairwise dependency relationship we identified in the previous stage into a dependency tree 
for each target endpoint. <coughs> in, this, in this dependency tree, the root node represents our target endpoint, PVE. So we create one uh, dependency tree for each target endpoint. And within this tree, any two directly connected endpoints represent a consumer and producer relationship. In this diagram, the PVE is the parent node and it is the consumer, and endpoint one is the uh, child node of PVE and it is producer. Again, producer output the value that consumer needs as input. And let's use this one as an example. Endpoint one is PVE's producer, and endpoint three and four are endpoint one's producers. In the next stage, with, with all the dependency relationship figured out in the next stage, we calculate the execution path to each target endpoint. In the dependency tree, a path from a leaf node to the root node represent a depend, uh, uh, an execution path, and there, may, there can be one or multiple execution path to each target endpoint. Let's plug in some real endpoint to show how we calculate the execution path. In this case, the PVE is delete comment, and it has two producers, get comment and post comment. And these two producers, in turn, also each has two producers. So in this case, our target endpoint, DD common, has two, has four execution path. Finally, in the last stage, we turn each execution path into an executable bash script and run the bash script to actually send API request to the target endpoint. The process is more complicated than just generating and running the script, as Ravid will explain in the next few slides. Thank you, Jay. Um, so before we going to see a real BOLA test and a demo, let's see the, the rest of the stages before we actually can uh, generate the test. So first, we will need to register the users and collect the login data. These steps also is done by AI with a human verification. First, we will generate uh, the user's credentials that meets the, cri the criteria. AI will uh, analyze the open API spec and, and understand what are the complexity of the username and password that uh, a user can have in the application. Next, we will create and execute the user's registration phase. And lastly, we will fetch the login data and save it in a dedicated uh, file for further usage. And before we can actually create the test, we need to isolate the test data. Open API spec can be really, really huge, and we don't want to deliver to, uh, to feed AI with a huge API spec. We want to cover only the specific data that is relevant for each test. So Jay mentioned we have a consumer and producers for each test. We will isolate only the data for these consumer and producers and create a new trimmed spec file, which we will feed AI. We do, we do it for efficiency. We want to have only accurate data to prevent AI from having uh, mistakes. And for cost, we want to have uh, the least amount of token that we can send the uh, AI. So when we try to generate a test script, it is saved as an executable bash uh, script. You can see an example of a really simple uh, BOA test. We have a consumer of uh, put a user password, and the producer will be get users, which will get the username. This test will be saved in a put get directory. Put will be the parent, get will be the child. And the test generation script actually runs uh, asynchronously in order to save time. And right now, we have an average time of 1.5 uh, seconds to generate each execution uh, bash script. Lastly, 
uh, we do we perform uh, where, where we run the test um, on the application we do it in a certain execution order and the main goal is to avoid uh, avoid any test failure due to technical reasons we want a test to be failed only if the PVE is not vulnerable to Bola which should be so we first run the test that populates data and resources to the application and only then try to fetch them to eliminate the, to eliminate the fact that uh, to fetch a non-existing uh, resources. And we try to push the delete and update uh, operations to the end. We don't want to delete a user and then try to fetch it because the test will fail due to a technical issue. And after we finished creating our methodology, we uh, actually made an evaluation process. So we evaluated Bolabuster against Restler. Restler is an open source API fuzzer created by Microsoft. Um, it's one of the best API fuzzers that you can find, at least open source. So we wanted to test our, our methodology ag against the best. And its goal is also to automate the testing of services through REST APIs um, and find security vulnerabilities, basically. And what we did is, you can see this table, we took three applications. This is open source application, uh, Vampy, Capital, and Crappy. All of them are uh, deliberately uh, vulnerable to the OWASP API top 10. So they have existing BOLAs. Um, you can see the number of BOLAs in, in each, each one of them. So again, we tested Restler um, against our tool. And this is the results of uh, the Rest Restler run. Uh, Restler couldn't discover any Bola vulnerabilities in, in either one of the application. Um, I will just say that we use the default configuration, and they claim that they do uh, find Bola with the default configuration, but they didn't. And the number of API calls you can see was pretty big thousands and even uh, hundreds of thousands calls, which making a lot of load on the application, obviously. And this is our results, which were amazing. We found all of the bolas in all of the applications. And we did it with less than 1% of the amount of API calls in comparison to Restler. So this is really huge. Um, in terms of the load, we didn't even make any load on the application, and we were able to find all of the bolas. Also, we focused in, on the true positive rate. So our goal was to, uh, have a, if an application has a bola, we, we will want to find it. Um, we, d we didn't really care at this stage about false positive, because it's really basically impossible to avoid them. But again, we had a 100% true positive rate, so we found all the bolas in the application. Um, now let's see an actual uh, bola test. So this is an high level example of a test. Uh, we have here two producers and one consumer, which is the PVE. So in this scenario, Alice will try to create an article. She will create a comment for this article. And eventually, Bob will try to delete Alice's comment, which is the potential Ebola. So first of all, um, Alice um, and Bob will log into the system. And they will get a unique uh, token. Afterwards, the sequence of the test will begin. Uh, Alice will create a new article in the system. We will save the article title. Later, later, Alice will create a comment for this article. We will save the comment ID. And lastly, Bob will attempt to delete Alice's comment. And this has two options uh, of results. So if we will be able to do it, we will get a 200 OK. And this is a potential Ebola vulnerability for this endpoint. Um, and if everything is correct and we have defenses, it will be, of course, forbidden. Let's see how the code looks like. So we have here uh, Alice, uh, which create an article. I hope you can all see it. Uh, first of all, we will create a unique random string. 
So we will try to use it as the article title to have a unique title every time. And then we will crea uh, create a post request to slash articles in, in, this, uh, in this case to create a new article. You can see that the authorization header is user A token. This is the identi identify that Alice is making the request. And we will use the random string as the article title. So this is the, the API call. We will save uh, the article title as a slag. And then Alice will try to create a comment for her article. Um, as, it, as you can see here, the, the, if you can see the slug, which is dynamically being used in this API call, um, this is the slug that we saved from the, the previous uh, API call. So we are using the article she already created. She cr create a comment, and we save the comment ID. And lastly, Bob will try to delete uh, her comment, so you can see the API call is being, we are using slag and comment ID, the one that we saved before. Now you can see that the authorization uh, header is user B, so this is the identifier of Bob instead of Alice. And basically, in the end, we will check if the test uh, passed. So just one sentence about the, the, the check. In, in this case, in our case, it's enough to, to mark a test as, as Ebola, a, a potential Ebola at least, if, you, if the PV returns 200, okay. If you think about it, every test we make is, is malicious by definition. We, the last request is a user trying to perform an action that he sh shouldn't be allowed to. So we expect not to get 200, okay? If we do, we can mark it as a high potential for Bora, and later on we perform a human analytics and checks to verify if it is a Bora. Okay, so for the fun part, let's see the CVEs that we found. Uh, and before that, okay, I'm, I'm not sure the demo will work. No, it's not working. Uh, I'm sorry, we have uh, technical issues. But let's see the bola that we actually found um, in the open source application. So first we have Harbor, which is a cloud native container registry. Um, it's basically a, a equivalent to Docker Hub. I'm sure that all of you know Docker Hub. Um, and it's a CNCF graduated project. So it's very popular. It's being used by, it's being downloaded by two million, uh, two million times. And we found, uh, in 2024, we found the Bola there. We have also Grafana, that I'm sure that most of you are familiar with. It's a very, very popular data visualization and monitoring tool. Uh, it has about 20 million users around the world. And we were also able to find the Bola there. And lastly, we have Easy Appointments, which is the appointment scheduling application. Um, it is less popular, but it has almost 200,000 uh, uh, download. Um, and we will manage to find 15 new BOAs there. Um, seven of these vulnerabilities are targeted as critical. So they have a CVSS score of 9.9, .9, which is the highest. So imagine that seven vulnerabilities out of the 15 allow uh, a full uh, compromise of the application. So you can do whatever, you can be an admin, basically. You can do whatever you want. Uh, so this, is, this was a pretty big, uh, a big achievement for us. And let's deep dive to talk about the Arbor uh, vulnerability. So Arbor actually has uh, projects and the feature that we found vulnerable is the project configuration metadata. Um, every project have users, so you can be an admin, you can be a maintainer, a developer, a guest, or a limited guest. And I hope you can see in the screenshot that uh, this is the configuration of a project in Harbor. Um, you can do a bunch of stuff. You can change it, the project to be private, public. You can create um, auto scan for image vulnerabilities and much more. So Arbor claimed that only the project admin 
can create and modify or delete this configuration, which makes a lot of sense. This is a crucial part of the, of, the, of the project. But we actually found out that when we are logged in as a maintainer, uh, first we try to modify these attributes via the UI. We, we were not able to do it, as should. But we found that we can do it via API. So there was a discrepancy between the UI and the API, which allow us to, to an unauthorized uh, user, basically, to create, edit, or delete the project configurations. So the issue here is the maintainer actually extend his privileges. And now we can make a private project public, deploy unverified images, and bypass vulnerability scanning, and, and more. Um, the consequences can be really bad. So we, you, you, as a malicious, uh, malicious maintainer, you can compromise the entire project integrity um, and the security posture, basically. So Harbour uh, recognized this uh, vulnerability and issued a CVE. Uh, it was not long ago, basically, like two weeks ago. And um, they published the details in their uh, security advisory. So if you want to take a look, it's open source, so you can go and do it. And also, if you want to read more about the technical details about this vulnerability and our uh, uh, methodology, uh, go ahead and scan this uh, code. This leads you to our blog that describes this uh, vulnerability. Yeah. Thanks, Arvid. I hope everyone understands by now why we need AI and how we use AI. We started the project by dropping an entire open API spec into ChatGPT and asked it to find all the BOLA endpoints. As you may imagine, the results were not great. And we not only exceed the token limit, but also confuse AI a lot. And so there, after many, many trial and errors, we gradually learned how to collaborate with AI to optimize its performance. And these are a few most important lessons that we have learned throughout the research. First, AI isn't always the best solution. AI should not be used to solve simple problems with heuristic solutions, like sorting, finding path, solving equations. These problems have existing if efficient and optimal solutions. Although we may use AI to solve these problems, but usually it does so in a much, at a much higher cost and longer time. Remember, don't shoot a mosquito with a shotgun. If an if a problem with existing heuristic solution, always choose heuristic over AI. Second, don't trust, always validate. Blindly trusting the output of AI can be very, very dangerous, especially in application, in critical application where mistakes can cost millions or even human life. In our research, we often generative AI often give us non-existent parameters, endpoints, or shell comments. In our case, these mistakes are not life-threatening, but they result in failed test case, false positive and false negative. As a result, it's so crucial, it is so crucial to always validate the output of AI before using them or passing them to the next stage. Lastly, makes AI's job easier. Treat AI like a very capable junior colleague who can do simple tasks extremely well. But it can start making mistakes if the tasks get more complex. It is thus the human supervisor's responsibility to simplify AI's task. In our case, it was a bad idea to just give the entire API spec of thousands of lights into AI. It confused AI a lot. As a result, we break each API spec into many, many smaller pieces and only fit AI the relevant pieces, the relevant pieces of the current task. When working with AI, divide and conquer is, a always, is always a good strategy. Although we have seen some promising and successful, successful result of this research, we still have some remaining challenge and room for improvement. First, 
our methodology is very sensitive to the quality of the input API spec. Currently, we treat the API spec like the absolute truth and build our entire test plan based on the API spec. However, throughout our research, we found that many open API specs, many API specs of the open source project are outdated or inconsistent with the actual API functionality. This inconsistency results in a lot of issues, failed tests, failed execution path, and, and false, positive, false positive and false negatives. Next, not every API application out there has an uh, API spec available. Some, some applications don't have maintainers or even documents, and there are applications deployed in more restrict environments such as industrial control system in which we don't have direct access. As a result, in the next phase of the research, we want to explore more data sources such as uh, PCAP, flow log, or even source code to help AI understand the application. Lastly, using generative AI model can be quite expensive, especially for the more advanced models. The, the cost of our methodology is proportional to the size of the API spec and the complexity, complexity of the application. Luckily, the rapid advancement of AI and the intense com market competition between AI service providers, the cost of AI has reduced a lot in the speed that faster than we could imagine. Compared to just six months ago, the cost of testing an application has been cut by half, while the performance and the speed of the model we use have all significantly improved. One amazing side effect of working, working with AI is that our, the performance of our application always get a free boost whenever there's a new generation of model available. And let's conclude our talk. I don't know if you have time for, for a question, but we can talk after. after. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.